Amen. So if you have a copy of the Bible with you this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn back to Mark's Gospel. We're going to be in chapter 10 today. If you want to use the pew Bibles in the rack in front of you, or if you're sitting in the front row right underneath you, you can turn to page 846, and that will get you to Mark chapter 10. And we're going to dive straight in this morning, beginning in verse 17. This is what Mark writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And as he, being Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers, and children and lands with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. Let's go to board together in prayer. Father, throughout these last 15 weeks now, as we've walked through these Spirit-inspired words in Mark's Gospel, it seems like we really did hit a pivot point in chapters 8 and 9 as Jesus begins to, to unveil more and more to his followers and to us what it means to be a part of your kingdom, what it means to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. Lord, there are many things in this passage today that we want to ignore, that we want to quickly brush aside or move past. And it's because of that, Father, that I pray your Holy Spirit would allow us to stay, would allow us to hear, and that you would give us eyes to see today. And that the same love that Jesus had for this man is the love that he has for us, a compassion desire and affection for us. Father, that we would hear his words clearly spoken to our hearts today, calling us to come and to follow no matter what the cost. It's in his holy and precious name, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a young raccoon who was traveling through the dense forest on a cool fall 
morning when suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he saw something sparkling, glimmering in a small hole in a fallen tree. Gripped with curiosity, the young raccoon runs up, takes a peek in, and with very little hesitation, reaches his hand into the small hole and wraps his tiny black fingers around a shiny nickel. And then all of a sudden, when he tries to pull his hand out of the hole, he discovers that his clenched fist is stuck and he can't get out. He's trapped. Now, many of you probably realize that shiny nickels don't just show up in the middle of a log in the forest. The young raccoon had fallen for an old coon hand trapping technique, the kind you see described in Where the Red Fern Grows, if you ever read that book. When a raccoon will stick his hand in a hole, he'll, he'll wrap his fingers around it, but then he won't be able to, to get his hand out. He's absolutely trapped. And because raccoons are incredibly stubborn and hard-headed, they would never even think about doing the one thing that would give him freedom. See, the real kind of irony about this trap is the only thing the coon has to do to get free is to let go of it. All he has to do is loosen his grip and let go to find freedom. Now we might shake our heads at the stubbornness of such a creature, and yet if there's anything we learn from our story today in Mark's Gospel is that we can be just as stubborn, if not more so, than that coon stuck in a hand trap in the forest. Because Mark's Gospel tells us a story about a, a man rushing up to see Jesus as he's making his way to Jerusalem. He's desperate to see Christ. We can tell that he's desperate because Matthew's Gospel tells us this guy is rich, Luke's version tells us he's a ruler, which means he's probably serving on some important council in the community, and yet he is running up to see Jesus. And in Middle Eastern culture then and still today, it is completely inappropriate and shameful for a man of status to run in public. And yet he's running up to see Jesus. Not only that, but when he gets there, he falls down at Jesus' feet in reverence and submission and respect. And probably out of breath at this point, he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the way Jesus responded to that genuine question probably took the man back for a second. Jesus says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, Jesus isn't denying his goodness with those words, but he is pointing to God as the ultimate source and definition of what is truly good, the measure by which all other goodness has to level up. Jesus goes on and says, you know the commands. You know what the word says. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor father and mother. And yet notice with these words, Jesus didn't say, follow these commands to get to eternal life. But he is beginning a conversation. He's beginning with the outward external commands of the law. And yet he doesn't intend to stay with the outward and the external, but to go to the inward, the internal, to the condition of this man's heart. But he starts with the outward. All these commands. All these commands had to do with his relationship, this young man's relationship with other people. Not with God, but with others. And the man responds saying, Teacher, all these things, all these commands I have kept from my youth. And that might sound arrogant for us, but, but there's a really good chance he was being sincere. Because when it came to the outward, external requirements of the law, there were many Jews who were faithful and devout enough to say, as Paul did in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, that when according to the law, they were blameless. It didn't mean they were perfect. It didn't mean they never made a mistake. But it did mean when they did, that they went through the proper sacrifices for atonement to, 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 to receive forgiveness. They were walking in accordance to the law, at least on the outside, at least when it looked like to others, they kept the line, they walked according to the letter every way they could. In fact, you get the sense that this guy is being very sincere. In fact, I would say we probably really like 
this guy. I mean, think about it. He's rich. He's successful. He's a leader in his community, probably well respected. And he doesn't come across as arrogant. He, he's not too good to run up to Jesus. He's not too good to fall down at his feet in reverence. And not only that, but he's probably, according to his own words, been walking in the ways of God, seeking to follow the commands of Scripture, and he's seeking after the kingdom. He's seeking after Jesus. I mean, there's a lot about this guy that I think we would like, we would respect, we would admire. If we have daughters, he's the kind of guy you hope that, he, that she brings home for dinner one day. In fact, Mark says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. His compassion grew towards him. And it's out of Christ's love and compassion that he says everything that comes next. Jesus looks at the man, Mark says, loved him, and says, you lack. Now let's stop there for a moment. Because with those two words, Christ highlights an essential, a crucial truth of the gospel and the nature of salvation. Again, this guy had everything together. He's successful. He's sincere. He's kingdom seeking. He's a leader in his community. He's probably well respected. And more than that, he's walking according to the commands of God. I mean, outwardly, he's got everything going for him. He's hitting on all cylinders. He's the kind of guy you probably nominate to be an elder or a deacon in your church. And yet for all of his outward success, for all of his outward righteousness, for all of his command keeping and law walking, Jesus can look at him and say, you lack. It's not enough. Folks, if this guy lacks, all of us do. If this guy can walk in this way, with this much success, with this much devote righteousness to the laws of God, and Jesus says, you lack, we all lack. And what did Jesus say that he lacks? He lacked one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Mark says that the man was disheartened by the saying. Literally, it says his face fell. It's a very unique phrase in the Greek. It actually only occurs one other time in the New Testament, and it used to describe the clouds, the sky darkening before a storm. Another translation says, gloom, a gloom spread all over his face, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see, while this young ruler walked in obedience to the external, the outward commands of the law with one command, with one request, the one thing that Jesus said revealed the first degree violation of the first and great command. You shall have no other gods before me. And with one command, Jesus revealed the idol of his heart. The one thing that he lacked was the one thing that he loved more than he loved God. You see, at this moment, Jesus has basically offered a substitute for this rich young ruler, saying, let go of your money, let go of your possessions, let go of your wealth, let go of this idol of your heart, and come follow me. And understand what true riches in the kingdom of God looks like. Let go of this and grab hold of that. Lay hold of me instead. And the young man said, no. You see, it's, it's important for us to recognize even now that the one thing necessary for this man to inherit eternal life wasn't selling all of his possessions and giving it to the poor. Because honestly, that would be too easy. 
Because you can live a life of poverty and still have a heart consumed by materialism and greed and love for money. Just like taking a vow of chastity doesn't all of a sudden cure a heart that's filled with lust. In fact, this man, if he had just sold all of this stuff, given it to the poor, and walked away, he would still walk away condemned. No, the thing that Jesus was calling him to, the heart of the matter, was in those last three words. Come, follow me. That's a lifetime of total allegiance, complete surrender, and absolute submission to Jesus. Not just a one moment flash in the pan obedience, selling all your stuff and giving away, but no, a lifetime of surrender, of denying yourself, taking up a cross, and following. We saw last week that Jesus says that his disciples have to be willing to cut off and remove whatever is necessary in order to follow him, whether it means slicing off the hand or cutting off the eye or, or taking off the foot, whatever it is that's keeping you from following me completely has to be drastically removed from your life. For this man, it was his wealth. For this man, it was his possessions and his, his material things. It was his money. That was the, the nickel that he had his hand stuck around in the trap that he refused to let go of. If he just let go of that and slipped his hand out, he would have followed Christ to freedom. That was the thing in his heart that was keeping him from that complete surrender, that total submission to Christ and to his kingdom. And so he walked away disheartened, missing the kingdom of God. The question that should hang heavy in the air in this room is what is that coin for us? What is that thing in our life that we have our hands so clenched around with a death grip that we would refuse to let go of it no matter what? What is that thing? Is it, is it money and possessions and wealth like this man in the story? Is it, is it reputation or success? Is it comfort and control? Is it sexual gratification? Is it our family? Is it our friends? Is it many good things that we can point to and say that's a good and right and God-given gift, but that we have so attached ourselves to that we cannot imagine life without it? I mean, to say it another way, what if Jesus came up to us and said, I want you to imagine life without blank. All you have is me. Am I enough? What would we put in that blank that would make us look at Jesus and say, no, you're not? Whatever that is, whatever our heart is so clinging to and wrapped around is occupying a dangerous place in our life. And again, many of those things can be good things. What is that for you? What does that for me? Because the fact of the matter is that Jesus does not and did not call every person who follows him that are not to, to sell all their possessions and give all their money to the poor. It's, this is not the case. In fact, we have other examples throughout the New Testament of, of men and women who were following Jesus, who were wealthy, who were affluent and used their wealth for the kingdom of God. And yet while that may be true, we would be absolutely foolish to ignore the warning of Jesus about the clear and present danger of wealth. I mean, look to what Jesus says next in verse 23. How difficult it will be, Jesus said to his disciples, for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And Mark writes, the disciples were shocked that Jesus said this. Why were they shocked? Because they had bought into a culture that, that interpreted many passages in the Old Testament with a very shallow understanding that if you had money, if you had wealth, if you had possessions, and that God had, had given you extra favor, that you were in right relationship with God. It was basically their version of the prosperity gospel. So if you were rich and wealthy, then, then oh, you were following God. You were keeping the commands. You were righteous. So when Jesus says it's going to be hard for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, that did not connect in their minds. And so Jesus said it again. And this time with a very vivid illustration. Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And as a citizen of the wealthiest nation on earth, with more first world problems than I can shake a stick at, and in a culture that surrounds me with messages of consumerism and materialism and constant dissatisfaction and wanting more and better than what I currently have, and a society that can pretty much justify anything as long as it's good for the economy. These words from Jesus should send a cold, wet chill running down the spine. Not only here, but throughout the gospel. Listen to what Jesus says in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 24. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve God and money. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 and 21. Christ says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus then goes on to tell a story about a rich fool who's gathering more and more and more of his stuff, more and more of what he currently has. And he has to tear down the barn that he has to build even a bigger barn to hold all his stuff. And back in 2017, the fastest growing industry in the United States was the industry of self-storage. Tearing down our barns to build even bigger barns because the house that we have now, the barn that we have now, isn't enough to hold our stuff. We need to get more barns to hold more stuff. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, Jesus tells that chilling story of a rich man who each and every day ate sumptuously and lived in luxury, and yet outside of his door was a beggar named Lazarus who he would not even care for in the slightest, and yet their roles are completely reversed in heaven and hell. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 24, it says, Woe to you who are rich now, for you have received your consolation. Again, these are the passages that we can quickly move past, we can quickly justify, we can quickly say, yeah, but, yeah, but, but these are words from Jesus. That we, in a culture, if we want to move past them very quickly, it probably means we shouldn't. We should stop and listen and linger just a little bit longer. Because Jesus is giving a very clear message about the clear and present danger of wealth, of materialism, of possessions. Why? Why does Jesus say how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Because the riches of this world sedate us. They numb us. They entrap us. They feed us the lie that we are self-sufficient. That we are independent. That we have need of nothing. Not even God. It's for this reason that Jesus said to the lukewarm believers in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Because a heart that is entrapped by wealth, by possessions, by the things of this world, is often a heart that is numb to the kingdom of of God. And so that's the warning that Jesus gives us. How are we to respond? Because again, we know that Jesus does not, or has not, called every single person who follows him to sell everything and give it all to the poor. So what is that universal call that goes out to all believers when it comes to this important issue? And it is an important issue. The number one subject Jesus talked about in the New Testament was the kingdom of God. Number two was money. This is important to Jesus. It should be important to us. So what is the universal call? Well, Paul gives us really great insight on this, both challenge and encouragement. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, Paul says, Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. That idea of being content is a foreign concept for many of us in our culture. Being satisfied with where we have, what we have. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of this world. If we have food and clothing, with these we should be content. Now, I'll be the first one to stand up and say, I'm not content with just food in my stomach and clothes on my back. 
And I mean, I can talk about this up here and I can read these words and I can have moments of contentment and see you take me to Cabela's and then my contentment is gone very quickly. <laughs> So we do go to this place, we see this thing, and all of a sudden we're stirred to we want more or better. But what Paul is saying here is we should be content with the basics of life. And not the luxuries that we're so often considered to be necessities. Like direct TV and Wi-Fi is not considered to be food and clothing in our, in our world. It's not the things that we consider to be essential aren't as essential as we may think they are. Verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In those words, you hear summarize so much of the teaching of Jesus on this subject. Then go to verse 17 in the same chapter. So how are we to live? How are we to walk in this area? Verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, by the way, that's all of us in this room, because I'm pretty sure everybody in the room drove a car today, um, so we're all rich in this present age. Charge them not to be haughty, that is, not to be proud, not to set their hopes on the uncertainties of riches, that our hope isn't to be in our bank accounts, in our 401ks. The most important inheritance we should give our kids isn't money or land. If that's all we can give our kids at the end of the day, is money or land, we have given them a pitiful inheritance. Because that's not really ultimately what matters. We don't put our hope in riches, Paul says, but on God, who, listen to this, richly provides us with everything for us to enjoy. Listen to that too. We're not to despise or hate the things that God has given us, but we are to enjoy them. Paul can say in, to the Philippians, I know what it's like to starve, and I know what it's like to be well fed. I know what it's like to, to not have nothing, and I know what it's like to abound. But the difference is he was content with either one. He was content with poverty and he was content with riches. He was content with being starving and content with having more than enough because his hope was in Christ. I can do all things in Christ who strengthened me. When we have the things, it doesn't say it's wrong to enjoy them. Instead, we are to be good, we are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share that generosity is so important. They're storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of that which is truly life. That question of life, eternal life, was one that hung heavy in the minds of the disciples, especially after Jesus just said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And so Mark writes, they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Again, think about what they just watched. They just watched a, a successful, sincere, seemingly devout leader in the community miss the kingdom of God. And they see him walk away and then say, okay, if that guy can miss it, who can be saved? And listen to what Jesus says next. It's so important. With man, it is impossible. With man, it is impossible. When it comes to the efforts of man, when it comes to our own achievements, when it comes to all our spiritual accolades, it is impossible for us to be saved. We cannot fix ourselves. We cannot rescue ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. Again, this guy had everything going right for him. And he still missed it because what was broken in him is broken in all of us. In Romans chapter 1, verse 24, Paul says that all of us, in different ways, worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. For him, it was money and, and possessions and wealth. For each of us in this room, it was probably something else. But our hearts are, are default bent away from God and not towards Him. Because our hearts are part of the problem, or the problem, we can't fix it. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We can't be enough to ever save ourselves. Jesus says, with man, it's impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things were possible. 
As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, that what the law was powerless to do because of us, because of the weakness of our flesh, because our hearts were bent against God, what the law could not do, God did. By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, he condemned our sin in the flesh of Jesus so that in Christ we would become the righteousness of God. Righteous before God. That what we were powerless to do, what we could never accomplish, God did. Again, the rich young ruler begins the conversation saying, good teacher, what must I do? What, was, what, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Me. What can I do, Jesus? And a few verses later, Jesus told his disciples, with man, it's impossible. But not with God. With God, all things are possible. It's not us earning or deserving or being good enough. It's about surrendering to what God has done for us in Jesus. Again, think of that, that image of the, of the raccoon with his hand stuck in a trap. With his hand clenched around something he won't let go of. It's an idea of surrender. It's an idea of letting go and surrendering, submitting fully to Christ and his kingdom. And when we do that by God's grace, and we can only do that by the grace of God, because just like that coon's instinct is to hold on and not let go, our heart's instinct is to hold on to the things of this world and not let go. It takes the Holy Spirit even coming into our heart and mind to allow us to release. But when we do, by God's grace, we receive far more than whatever we let go of. Peter, who's always quick to pipe up in the conversation, says, Jesus, we left everything and followed you. And Jesus says, truly, I say to you, there is not one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and the age to come eternal life. It's this image of one house is gone, a thousand other doors have opened for you. One brother in the flesh has been taken away. A thousand more brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles in the faith have become part of your family. You've become part of them. It's this image of the church. And yet, it's an image of what the church should be and sometimes what the church has failed to be. But even when the church fails to be all that we're called to as the body of Christ, this promise does not fail because the promise rests on Christ and not on us. There have been testimonies of, of missionaries like Hudson Taylor who spent 50 years in China. 50 years without this bustling, rich Christian community to draw from. Without many of the things that you see described here. Yet after 50 years of suffering as a missionary on the front lines of China, he walked away and said, I never made a sacrifice. I never made a sacrifice. Because what he had in Christ was richer than anything he gave up. Again, what's that thing that you and I have our hands wrapped around that we won't let go of? What's that thing that we're thinking is, is better than Christ, better than the kingdom of God? What does it look like for us to let it go? Jim Elliot, another famous missionary, once said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let's pray together. Gracious God, these words hit heavy on the hearts of people like me who live in more luxury, more comfort, more affluence than 95% of the world. Father, we recognize that we cannot receive a single thing that has not first been given to us through your hand in the heavenlies. And so we should acknowledge that so much of what we have, everything, God, is a gift from you, and yet Father, we are so prone to love the gift rather than the giver. We're so prone to put our, our trust and our faith, our hope in the things of this world rather than in Christ. 
Father, that can look like so many different things. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's possessions, sometimes it's wealth like it was for this young man. But for others, it's something completely different. We have our, our hands wrapped around something so tightly, often good things that you're calling us to surrender, to let go of, to give over to you. Father, I pray that for each of us in this room, your Holy Spirit would do that deep tissue work in our hearts and reveal what that is. Father, we would be able to, to walk in contentment, to walk with an open hand, that whatever it is, that we'd be able to let it go. And if it stays there, great. If it doesn't, great. Because our hope and our, our faith and our delight is in Jesus. Father, help me to do that. Help all of us to do that. For your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.